All right, let's talk about the nutrient cycles. Um, the first cycle we're going to talk about is the water cycle. I know a lot of you have heard about the water cycle. This is a big part of like middle school curriculum. We're going to just keep it simple and talk about the major terms that you guys have probably all heard about already. Um, water cycle, major terms, evaporation, you know, water going from a liquid to a gas phase. Condensation is a fancy word that means going from a gas phase to a liquid phase, and that condensation generally leads to cloud formation, which means it's going to fall back to the earth as precipitation. All right? But basically, your cells are about 80% water, between 70 and 90. Um, so you need water to survive. Water is paramount to uh, humans and paramount for our life. Um, where is water stored? Well, everyone knows the ocean is full of water, but that is not water that is readily usable for us because it's full of so much salt. Um, groundwater is one of the main sources of fresh water for people, basically. Yeah. Evaporation, we talked about that. That's going from a liquid to a gas. Transpiration is a fancy word that has to do with evaporation of water from leaves. Um, it pulls the water out of the leaves. Why is transpiration important? Because as water gets removed from the leaves, you guys probably remember that water sticks to other water molecules, and this is how water gets pulled up a plant to the leaves. So these leaves need water. How do they get water? They get it from their roots. How do they defy gravity and pull water up? Through transpiration. So as water evaporates from the leaves, it pulls on the water molecules below it, pulling them up the stalk and towards the leaves. So transpiration is how water moves up plants. You may have done an experiment when you were a kid where you took celery and you put it into food coloring. Eventually those leaves became the color of the food coloring and that is because it evaporates from the leaves pulling the water up the stalk. The food coloring actually comes up the stalk. Let's talk about the carbon cycle. This is a big one. Why is it a big one? Because we humans make a lot of carbons Car specifically carbon dioxide. How do we make it? Sure, when we do respiration, we produce carbon dioxide. That's one of the gases organisms exhale during respiration. But a lot of the carbon dioxide that's making its way into the atmosphere is coming from the burning process. And when do we burn things? You burn things, and the fancy word for burning is combustion. You burn things when we make electricity, we burn fossil fuels, um, natural gas, and coal to produce electricity. We drive cars that run on gas. So when you burn anything, you are going to be pretty much, if you do a combustion reaction with burning, you are releasing CO2 to the air. When you exhale or any other organism does respiration and it exhales, that respiration, that's how it produces the CO2. So these are the two processes, combustion and respiration, that produce carbon dioxide in the air. The whole process of photosynthesis removes that carbon dioxide from the air and puts it back into a plant, basically, into, into a living thing. This plant, this biomass, so CO2 from the air can get turned into biomass during photosynthesis. This photosynthesis gets consumed by these plants. They get consumed by other organisms and they produce biomass also in the process. What's happening? Well, I just said to you, Producing electricity is, we basically burn a lot of natural gas or we burn coal. When you burn these things, these are organic things made out of carbon. Coal is carbon. And when you burn these things, you release it. You release CO2 back in the air. So humans have released far too much CO2 in the air. It is affecting our weather. And we'll talk about it later in this lecture. Um, over here, in a, lot of, uh, in a lot of equatorial countries, rainforests are getting cut down to, to uh, clear up space for farming. People need food. You got to give them, you, they need food. And what they're doing is they're, instead of, you know, growing in areas, you know, areas, certain areas are better for growing food, they're trying to create space. And what they're doing is they're setting fire to a forest to create that space. The nitrogen cycle. This one's a little more complicated because there's a lot more terminology that goes into it. All right, so there's a lot of stuff that you're going to hear in a second. You're going to hear the term nitrogen fixation, and there's nitrogen fixing bacteria involved in that. You're going to hear the term nitrification, and you're going to hear the term ammonification, and you're going to hear the term denitrification. All right, so let's go. Let's go through this whole process, and then we'll we'll define all the terms. The nitrogen cycle is very important. 
And nitrogen is very important. What do you need nitrogen for? To make proteins, to make DNA and RNA. 78% of the air that we breathe is nitrogen. So when you inhale, 78% of it is nitrogen. Okay. Um, where, how do plants? Plants need nitrogen because plants produce some of these proteins that we need. That's one of the major nutrients for a plant. So how do they get it? They generally get it from their soil or from the fertilizer we add to the soil. And in, in, in soil, the fertilizer is added as a nitrate. Plants, they like nitrates. Nitrogen gas in the air, they cannot use it. That's N2. They cannot use nitrogen gas yet. It's not usable for the plant. To make it usable, you got to turn it into a different form that can dissolve in water, for example, like a nitrate, and then the plant can absorb the nitrogen as a nitrate. So fertilizers loaded with nitrates. Nitrogen fixation. Um, this is a process where nitrogen gas pulled from the air and gets turned into a usable form of nitrogen called a nitrate in this case, all right? Who does this process? Well, a whole bunch of bacteria do this process. They do it in a whole bunch of steps, and this will show you the steps as we get to them, and eventually it becomes nitrate. There's your nitrate, right? And nitrate can be assimilated and used by the plants. It can be used by the plants, all right? Ammonification, all right? Here's what happens, all right? Things die. So decomposers, they break them down. All right. So decomposers break down dead things, they break down waste products, and they turn them into ammonia. All right. Ammonia then gets turned into an ion called ammonium. So ammonification, I'll show you where that. It it's right here. You have the decomposers, they break things down, and they turn whatever the nitrogen and, and the proteins that they were made out of, they break them down. Okay, so they break down the proteins and the, the nitrogen that's in the tissue, they break it down, and they eventually turn it into ammonium. This is called ammonification. Why is it important? Because this is a couple steps away from nitrate. When nitrate is a usable form. Nitrification. All right, so here's what happens. Ammonium, right here, we're right here on the chart. Ammonium with special other bacteria gets turned into nitrite, NO2 negative 1. Nitrite gets affected by other bacteria, again, and the nitrites become nitrates. So nitrification is where you take ammonium, and it gets eventually turned into nitrate. Nitrate is now the usable form for the plant. This is good for the plant. Denitrification. This is not good for the plant. So let's go back to this chart. On this chart, we have nitrate here, and nitrate can be assimilated in the plant. This is fertilizer. Some bacteria, denitrifying bacteria, they remove nitrates from the soil, and they turn them back into nitrogen gas, unusable nitrogen for the plant. So this is a bad process for plants. This is not good for a plant, because if you have a lot of denitrifying bacteria in that area, it means that soil will not have a lot of nitrates in it, which means the plants will be missing one of their major nutrients. Speaking of major nutrients, this is one of the major nutrients that made its way into the water recently, causing the red tide and the algae bloom in San Diego's uh, waters recently. Now let's talk about the phosphorus cycle. Why is phosphorus important? Well, once again, DNA and RNA, important. Phospholipids in your, in your cell membranes or your plasma membranes, and energy, ATP. That P stands for phosphorus right there. How do plants get their phosphorus? Well, they get it from soil, and it's dissolved in water. How is it dissolved in water? The usable form is generally a phosphate. This is the one that dissolves in water. How do you and me get our phosphorus? Well, when we eat. That's how we get our phosphorus. So most phosphorus is found in rocks, and how does it make its way into soil? Well, they get weathered or broken down, and then the erosion will move them to another area, and then they will get deposited and then you have phosphates in the soil. So it's pretty much rock debris and rock matter. And isn't that what soil is made out of? That's one of the, the components of soil. And by the way, I just mentioned to you about the red tide and the algae bloom here in San Diego, the algal bloom. Uh, the other nutrient that causes algal blooms are phosphates and phosphorus. Nitrates and phosphates are the two ones that cause algal blooms. It's not good for the environment where they end up in.
All right, our last section is biomes. There are nine major biomes. So what's a biome? It's a large area on a planet that has certain types of plants or vegetation, basically. Let's begin. San Diego's biome is the first one, Chaparral. Um, this looks like a hillside near Valhalla right here, or uh, an area you might be hiking, like Cow's Mountain over here. Um, Chaparral biomes are generally found in areas that are about 30 degrees north latitude, which is kind of real close to where San Diego is located. Um, you may hear the term Mediterranean. Well, that's the, the type of climate that you have in a Chaparral biome. What are our trees? Well, I'm going to show you what it looks like in a Chaparral biome. In a second. Here we go. So the red is the chaparral, and this is right around 30 degrees north latitude, and you also got it right around 30 degrees south latitude. They're generally near coastlines, and you notice they're on the western side of continents also. Um, these are areas, this is San Diego. It's amazing. We have perfect weather, so to speak. People come from all over the world to enjoy our weather. Chaparral biome and Mediterranean climate is, is amazing. Here's what we got. You've probably seen these, all these types of animals or organisms at some point, in, or some type of these at some point. We have the rabbit, the quail, the coyote, the lizard, snakes. I just saw a dead, a dead snake uh, on the street the other day, ran over by a car near my house. Squirrels, hawks, I see hawks all the time, flying around, floating around, looking for prey. Here, probably looking for that little pocket mouse. We have uh, jays, skunks. Rat rattlers, uh, lizards all over the place. This is San Diego. Look at all these different types of shrubs and plants that we have. Um, what is unique about our biome? Our biome actually is adapted to having fires. So our biome actually likes fire. Fire helps the seeds germinate. So some seeds of the plants in our biome require the high temperatures for them to actually sprout and germinate. So after a fire, um, things grow back, and they grow back rather nicely. The fire puts a lot of nutrients back into the soil, and then think, and a lot of these seeds that are now able to germinate generally come back, and they come back very nice. Keystone species. Now, this is a term we're going to define. These are organisms that have a huge, huge impact on their environment. Okay? Huge impact on their environment. How do they impact their environment? They basically, well, let me give an example of the, the uh, sea otter and the sea urchin on the next page. This will explain to you. So you have the sea otter, you have the sea urchin, and you have the giant kelp forest. So let's explain their, their little story. Sea otters, all right. So there was a point where sea otters were hunted, and they were almost hunted to, uh, in certain areas, extirpation or extinction in a particular area. Well, what they realized is when they got rid of the sea otters that the kelp forests got destroyed. So the absence of sea otters meant kelp forest destruction. Well, what happened? Well, sea otters, they eat these little purpley sea urchins, right? Sea urchins, these guys eat kelp forests. So what do the sea otters do? They keep the sea urchin population in check, right? So they have a job. Generally, the top of the food chain is a very, or towards the top of the food chain is a very important organism. They keep the populations below them in check. Without sea otters, your sea urchins aren't in check. So they, they reproduce and they take out the entire kelp forest. So the absence of sea otters will destroy the kelp forest. So they are a big player in this environment called a keystone species. All right, we're going to stop there.